You're listening to a podcast of Spurious Morality. Hello and welcome to a podcast of Spurious Morality. I'm Connor and today I'm joined by Jimmy. Hi, great to be back. And also by Ben, my brother. Hi, thanks for having me again. Um, And we're here to do another episode on the Doctor Who Magic the Gathering set. We'd actually hoped it would be, we'd actually intended to do one episode, but there's that much to talk about um, that we couldn't fit it all in. We'll have to come back and do another one. Um, So we'll pick up just where we left off then, and we'll talk about Paradox Power. So this is the deck that represents the 12th and 13th Doctor's era. Um, The face commanders are the 13th Doctor and Yaz. Um, And Ben, you'd maybe kick us off by telling us a little bit about this deck and and how it works. Yeah. So the, the main way of playing cards for Magic is you draw a card at the start of your turn into your hand, and then you can play cards from your hand if you have enough lands to tap to pay the cost to cast. But there are a few other ways to cast cards. Some of them we've touched on. For example, in Timey Why Me, you're playing cards from Exile with the Suspend mechanic. Um, your commanders sit in a separate zone outside of the game called the command zone which gives you access to them whenever you want so whenever you play your commander that's not casting the card from your hand you can also play some cards from your graveyard um and um you can also just play cards regularly from exile if they've been exiled um with the intention of doing that um there's kind of multiple zones of exile there's like a permanent exile where if you play a card that says i exile this it's gone forever but some cards like the ecstatic beauty one um let you exile cards temporarily and you can play them for a certain amount of time after the fact um and all of those things will trigger the 13th doctor's main ability yes so this out of out of all the decks this is the one that i was um least i think this is the one i have the least experience with and we sat down and played a few games last night um, and i just played this one because i wanted to learn a bit more but i do have a much better handle on it now and there's some really great cards in here um jimmy what do you think of paradox par it's certainly an interesting one i think it's got an easier job to do capturing only two doctors eras rather than like the classic series deck has all of that and the previous new series deck has to have 9, 10, and 11, and the War Doctor. I mean, this has the Fugitive Doctor too, but it's still, it's a lot easier for it to capture all that has all the areas that it covers. Um, I think there's a few things I didn't like. The main one for me that, again, it squibbles over um, technicalities, but Madame Vastra, great card, but why is she Lizard? She's a Silurian. She should be Dinosaur. And I mean, in terms of the non-Doctor Who magic cards, you've got a huge dinosaur expansion about to come out. Why wouldn't you make her a dinosaur? Oh, that's a bit of a shame. Um, but other than that, I um, and I like the way she could pair with um, with Jenny as a commander instead of um, with, you know, Doctor or Companion sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I think this deck um, is one that I've... Uh, thought a bit less about so i've sort of given it a quick look but there was not much that really jumped out to me as either hugely bad or hugely great it just seems yeah it's uh, pretty good um the one thing i will say is i'm it sort of ties to another deck but this deck and the twice upon a time card um i'm so annoyed that was in the classic series deck that story Well, I'm doing the season by season here, so we'll get to it eventually, but I think most people who know how much of a fan I am of the Hartnell era will know 
uh, what I have to say about that story. So seeing it in the classic deck was a bit disappointing. And here it actually fits. This is the deck where it should have belonged. We could have got one more classic series stock to, uh, or story, I mean. So, yeah, that was uh, a bit of a disappointment with that one. <laughs> I actually think Timey Wimey, uh, not Timey Wimey, sorry, I actually think uh, Twice Upon a Time is a great card, purely because it lets you pull out Doctors. Um, it lets you take an extra turn as well, I think. I have a wee story about that card, which we'll get to, but I, I like it as well. Um, even even if even if maybe the story isn't great, although it's been a while from I've seen it, um, in terms of, of mechanically speaking for the game, it's, it's quite a strong card. Um, it says this is a adventure card, which is a mechanic that this card is like split into two halves. So you can play the first half and then it goes into exile and then you can play the second half from exile, which will, of course, trigger the 13th Doctor. So the first card or the first part of Twice Upon a Time says you may search your library for a Doctor card and put it into your hand and then shuffle. And then the second part of the card lets you take an extra turn if you control two or more doctors. Uh, Jimmy, I'm sure you've you've had a, a fair amount of experience with extra turns. Maybe back whenever you were you were playing, they're they're generally very strong spells, and there's there's no exception here. Yeah, the the main cards that did that was sort of probably just before my time with the third edition and revised and all that. So I think most of them got sort of filtered out then. But um, yeah, it's certainly an interesting mechanic. And um, I think with the Twice Upon a Time card, I understand the bit better now because I've never seen a card like that with two separate cards on one card. I mean, I think I briefly got the Kamigawa one or two um, sets of that back in the day and the card could turn upside down and become a different creature or whatever. But with this one, I just assumed it was like a choice of you could do one spell or the other, and I didn't realise it was a sort of play one, then then it turns into the other. So, um, yeah, I may not like the story it's based on, but it at least seems a bit more useful and valuable now that I understand the uh, mechanics of it. I have, I have, but yeah, that, 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 that's a really good insight, Jimmy, and, and you've made something click in my head about, about the design of this card now, and I love it even more. So the the adventure mechanic, which is the which is the two halves that this is split into, came from a set, a magic main set a few years ago called Throne of Eldrain. Now that is a set based on like traditional fairy tales. It's the fairy tale set of magic where um the card art is kind of set up like an adventure book, like it's like a storybook, and on one page is the first half of the card, and on the second page is the second half of the card. Um, and the idea is that, you know, if it was a creature, you would send the creature out on its adventure. So it will go and do something. And then the second half of the card is the creature coming back. Um, and it usually relates to what the adventure did. So this one has you going to get another doctor card. And then the second half is uh, assumed you've played your second doctor and then you can take an extra turn with it. But because the adventure mechanic is so synonymous with fairy tales, I just remember now the twelfth Doctor and the the first Doctor in this story having a deep conversation about fairy tales and about how fairy tales didn't exist in the world. And then obviously that episode's about the Christmas truce, and it ends with the twelfth Doctor saying that it's up to them to create fairy tales in the real world, and they use the mechanic from the fairy tale set, and that just comes together really nicely. And I've and I've only just realised that now. Um, home run. That's 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 great. Actually, you're right. I hadn't twigged on that either. Um, but that that's that's fantastically put together then for that card. As I said, Gavin Verhey very passionate about Doctor Who, and and there's a lot of this in the cards. Just a lot of care and attention that's gone into the designs and the the choice of mechanics used. Really nice touch. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, there's a couple of other cards here then to, to pick out and talk about as well. Um, Clara Oswald. So Clara, um, at the end of Series 7, as we know, Clara got sent back through the Doctor's timeline to help all of them. Um, she's actually represented here as a colourless companion. So uh, the way it works is she can, uh, before she's played, before the start of the game, you choose the colour that Clara represents. So she could be any of them. Um, that means Clara can be put into any of these decks and can run with any of the Doctors. 
Um, so that's great flavoring. Um, and she basically comes in and helps them um, in, in the story. And what the way that's represented here is um, she, if, if a triggered ability of a doctor, you know, triggers, um, Clara makes that happen a second time. So she's really strong. She's very versatile. You can put her into any of these decks, run her with any of the doctors, and she just makes the doctor's ability happen twice. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I thought she seemed like an interesting card. I mean, as you say, working with any doctor is a great way to represent mechanically that story where she goes back through the doctor's time stream. The thing with me that was weird for her was, of course, back in the day I played you didn't have really colourless stuff except for artefacts. And so I just look at the card and I'm like, Clara's an artefact? And I just, I, I know she's not, but it just took me a bit of getting used to. But, um, yeah, I think that's a cool, one of the cool things that have changed about magic since I played it is experimenting with stuff like that and like um, colourless spells that aren't just artefacts or how they've um, added sagas and added plain, planes as a card and added... Um, actual planes walkers as a card which is i think one of the most interesting things um so yeah it's um pretty cool to see how things have changed in that regard absolutely at least she's not an eldrazi i will say <laughs> <laughs> um the other couple of other ones i want to talk about are madame vastra and jenny flint and this uses the partner mechanic again so this is where you've got you know a couple of characters who are so synonymous with each other you can't have one without the other and Vastra and Jenny are set up that if you play one of them, you get to search your deck. You get to search your deck and take the other as well. Um, the art on the two of them as well is sort of uh, the two characters back to back. Um, for Vastra's art, the cameras and the camera as such is in front of her, and you can see her. You can see Jenny behind her. Jenny's card is the opposite, so where you can see Jenny with Vastra behind her, and it's like the, the same moment taken from two different points of view. It looks great. It fits the characters perfectly, I think. I love that that's there, and I love it it's there for those characters. Um, one of my favourite cards in the whole set, the whole Doctor Who set, is the Foretold Soldier, and that's because the flavouring is done so well and it's done so strongly. So the way he works is, as we've said, uh, I think we've mentioned this before. Ben, you might give us a wee run-through of it now. Foretell is a mechanic in Magic anyway. Yes, it's relatively new and there's not a lot off the cards because it was only in one set. It was in the, the Norse mythology themed set where you can... And it's very similar to trap cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! If any of the listeners have any experience with Yu-Gi-Oh! They'd, they'd maybe understand this a bit more. That you can take a card from your hand, put it in exile outside of the game, uh, and then you can play that on a later turn for its... Uh, foretell cost which is usually cheaper than the main cost so it's a way to sort of um, plan ahead and sort of put almost trap cards down it, it links to Yu-Gi-Oh very closely so as we said the, the, the character in or the, the villain in the show is called the foretold soldier and it makes use of magic's foretell mechanic that happens as well I think with the Vashta Narada we'll talk about them when we come to the villains deck um the thing with the foretold soldier in Doctor Who is that whenever a character sees it, they have 66 seconds to live. When you look at the uh, foretold soldier's power and toughness here, it's 6-6. Six, six. So that ties in very strongly as well. Um, the foretold soldier must be blocked. Characters in the show feel compelled to try and stop the foretold getting to them. Um, it can't be blocked by more than one creature because in the show only one person can see it at any given time. Um Whenever the card deals damage, it gets exiled face down and becomes foretold. That, again, you know, when, whenever the foretold attacks someone and kills someone in Doctor Who, it disappears and comes back later on. Flavoring has been done so well on that card, it jumped out to me straight away. I think it was one of the earliest ones they revealed, um, and it just clicked. Um, it's really, really good. I love it. I also think it's extremely funny uh, that we have the next two cards, um, purely because it's the actors who played them. Uh, we have Graham O'Brien and Astrid Peth, and it's now possible to build a Bradley Walsh magic deck and a Kylie Minogue, Astrid, uh, Kylie Minogue magic deck. I think that's really, really funny. Um, and then the saga that jumped out for me in this set was uh, Fugitive of the Judoon. So there's a couple in here, but this one I think works very well. Um, so you get a 1-1 white human creature. The art on that is Ruth. Um, 
from Fugitive of the Jadoon. Um, and you also get a, a, a white, it's called an alien rhino card. It's the Jadoon. The art on the card is the Jadoon. Um, the second stage you investigate and then you get to the third stage. Um, actually, Bimmy, you would tell us what investigate actually does. Yes, investigate's very simple. You make a little artifact token that says pay two mana and draw a card. That's entirely fair. But that sort of represents them investigating Ruth's background and trying to work out why the Jadoon are after her um, and, and what the mystery was. Yes, drawing a card is very, um, it's related to sort of knowledge and, and, and gaining new knowledge and filling your hand with new spells that you can cast. So the idea is that it's a clue token which you can expend to get more knowledge. And then you get to the third step of this saga, and what it says is you can exile a human you control and an artifact you control. So you get to exile Ruth, and uh, you're in, you know the the, inve- the the clues that they have picked up while they're investigating. Um, if you do that, you search your library for a doctor card, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle. That represents Ruth, you know, the human Ruth disappearing and turning into the fugitive doctor. Um, great card. I love, as we've said, you know that you get this story represented through the mechanics and you get to tell this Doctor Who story out on the table. Um, so that is that is great. Um, is there anything else we'd like to add about that deck? Yes. I um, The other things I think are definitely, first of all, Vastra and Jenny, I agree, brilliant idea to have the art represent back and forward the, the same scene, but... Um, that's definitely one of the better cards in the deck. But the other ones that I particularly liked, uh, where are they? I've got them all up in up tabs at the moment. Um, oh, yes. First, River Song. I think her ability sounds like it would be pretty useful and powerful, um, not so much the uh, doing the deck in reverse one. That's just, yeah, not, not as much. But the spoiler's ability about um, getting plus one, plus one every time someone else sort of looks at a spoiler, as it were, that's got to be really powerful, and um, so yeah, I think she 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 seems like she should make a really good commander too. And the other one I particularly liked was the um, bigger on the inside card. Um, good art of showing the inside of Thirteen's Tardis, and the ability sounds like it'd be pretty powerful and useful too. To just two extra mana of any color every turn, essentially. That's yeah, it sounds really useful as a magic card and it's really good as an art and Doctor Who. So, yeah, those are some of my favourites of this deck. Yes, River River jumped out, I think, to a lot of people um, straight away as, as, as a particularly strong card and, again, flavoured very well. There are a good number of strong cards in this deck and maybe where it's somewhat less interesting in, in gameplay than... The, the timey wimey deck it is by no means less powerful that little extra turn spell um i mentioned earlier um in one of our games i was able to sort of assemble an engine so to speak with the cards that i had on the battlefield which facilitated me casting that extra turn spell uh t- three times in a row to take uh an extra an extra three turns um which of course is is somewhat bananas and and if if you don't win the game after doing that you've done something wrong and i think that that speaks again to the philosophy of the 13th doctor um you know her her card art is her um uh you know working with 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 tech and you know she builds her own sonic screwdriver from from scraps lying around in a garage she was a very hands-on creative doctor in that way and and the gameplay of the paradox power deck um has a lot of value pieces and you kind of assemble your own little value engine with the cards that you have at any given point and in all the games i played with the paradox power deck they were all very different and all involved me doing very different things and and it was very creative in the way that you played the cards um they work very well together and and um, um, interact with each other in unique ways. I, I I have actually been looking, you know, to find what the Thirteenth Doctor's flavor is, and it's as you've said, she pulls the sonic screwdriver together from scratch. She's actually pulling cards from all different places, little random. She's pulling out of the graveyard, um, from here, there, and everywhere. Um, that that fits really well. It's very Absolute, resourceful. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, so that's great. That's great. 
the last of the four decks released then as part of this set is Masters of Evil, which I think I think a lot of the cards in here individually are very, very strong cards. I haven't had as much of a chance to play it as the others because I think it works best as part of a pod of four rather than uh, versus one other player, um, particularly because there's a, a, a mechanic that features quite heavily here called Myriad, which sort of requires you to have more than one opponent. Um, and we'll, we'll, we can talk about it whenever we get to some of the cards that have it then. Um, ben, what do you think? You can kick us off, Ian. What do you think of Masters of Evil? Okay. Um, who doesn't love a baddie? <laughs> no. So maybe this is the deck, apart from Blast from the Past, which I have the least experience with. Um, I've only played one game in a, in a, in a pot of four players with this one, and I had... I had a lot of fun with it. It is it is a fun, it's just a fun deck. Um, the commander for this deck is Davros, the, the creator of the Daleks. And what he wants to do is deal as much damage to, to each opponent as possible because at the end of your turn, you make a 3-3 black Dalek artifact creature with menace. Um, if an opponent lost three or more life, in that turn, and then each opponent who lost three or more life this turn faces a villainous choice. So a villainous choice is a new mechanic, although it's it's essentially um, just just it's very similar to the existing voting mechanic, which exists in mechanic already. So for this card in particular, opponents can either have you draw a card or they will discard a card. So they face a choice that really has two bad options. Um kind of similar to what Davros or or another villain would have the doctor choose, you know, is it, oh, save the world or, or save your companion, you know, um, a, a, a difficult choice to make. Um, so the idea is here that whenever you deal three or more damage to the opponent and make your Dalek, uh, that Dalek is then able to go out and attack a different opponent uh, next turn. So as you build your army of Daleks, uh, more and more of your opponents are going to be making these villainous choices and their cards are going to deplete from their hand. Your cards in your hand are going to increase and you'll have more options. Um, but if you're only playing against one person, it's going to be a lot less powerful. So that is maybe the main drawback of Davros in that you sort of have to be playing with with more people. It's it's more di- it's more difficult to break this deck out on a, on a whim, I'd say. But... It's decks full of great cards, great fun cards, and um, I liked it. Yeah, I, I like it as well. It 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 whenever we, I've played a couple of games with it against you know three other opponents, and um, which would be a, a full pod for commander. Um, I think it works really well in there, and, and some of my favorite cards are in here from the set as well. Jimmy, what do you think of Masters of Evil? Yeah, it certainly seems like an interesting one. As you say, it's uh, probably a bit complicated in some ways and requiring more opponents rather than just one-on-one. Um, so that certainly makes it interesting. I love that they've done such a good job of representing so many different eras um, that every master got a card that, that even um, with the Ainley master card, it's also got the Jeffrey Beavis Peter Pratt version in the back and the whole body thief mechanic ability that it's got sort of represents that and sort of covers both incarnations, so I think they did pretty well to get uh, two separate incarnations in a single card and still cover everything. Um, the Daleks do seem very powerful, especially with the Exterminate card. That seems like the way it, uh, I forget the term, I haven't got the card up at the moment, but um, the way it sort of replicates and the more Daleks you've got, the more, the more you can exterminate, that seems pretty good. And the Sidemen too, I like that they, they had the token for them and that, You've got plenty of cards that can create Sidemen and make Sidemen. I think the uh, the one thing that I didn't like about that was I, I, I love the token art that they did get, but I think that would have been a good opportunity to just represent different ones like here's 10th Planet Sidemen token, here's a 80s Sidemen token, here's a <laughs> new series. And um, it's still cool that the Sidemen cards did represent both types. There's an 80s Sidemen on the Sidemen Patrol. You've got a shard from the new series. Um, yeah, the Sidemen actually seem pretty powerful and pretty useful in this. Um, Mechanics-wise, um, 
sorry, not mechanics wise, law wise, the things that interest me on this one are it was good to see Turlo get a card, even though he's a sort of bad companion baddie at the start. So they put him in the black deck with the villains and um, yeah, but they did a good job with him. The, what, the thing that interests me is he didn't get the type human, which is quite right because he's an alien, but for some reason both Nyssa and uh, Advic do get the type human. So, again, it's, it seems almost like maybe different people are in charge of the different decks because why otherwise are some alien companions human and some not? So that was a bit odd. And the other lore one is um, on the art – the actual Davros card art, brilliant picture of him, but then you've got the genesis of the Daleks art where he's raising both arms, which is uh, a bit of a failure to have, um, you know, represented him because he always has that one arm under that he can't move. And so, but yeah, um, story-wise, interesting idea, having all the villains composing a single deck and they've done such a variety. Like you've not just got the Masters, the Cybermen, the Daleks, you've got the, the Beast, you've got... Rassilon, um, Vashnarati, you've got, um, yeah, a little bit of everything. And even down to 13s here with Fashad, a unique figure for the Sidemen. So, yeah, it certainly seems like a quite an interesting deck. But as you say, maybe a little complicated in some ways and a bit, a bit of a penalty if you're playing one-on-one that most of the uh, abilities that require more players would be sort of neutered a bit. So that's a bit of a shame. But overall, it seems quite a good one. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. One of the things that jumped out to me about it is I think it probably has the highest number of alternate commanders who can run the deck on their own. So that's, you know, the doctors, you know, if, to run these decks as as is with the three colors, the doctors need a companion. These come, this, this deck has a lot of alternate commanders and they each sort of represent a different faction of Doctor Who villain. Um, so you have uh, Missy who represents the Master. She's one of the alternate commanders. You've got the Rani um, who was another Time Lord Renegade. Um, you've got the Cult of Scarrow who can command the deck sort of on behalf of the Daleks. Um, Ashad's, you know, the lone Cyberman, he can command on behalf of the Cybermen. And then you've got the Valyard sort of to represent the Time Lords. I think that's great. Um, I think the choices that they've, they've had there are, are fantastic. Um, flavoring on the Cult of Scarrow is really good as well um, because it sort of focuses in on the personalities of the different Daleks. They, those Daleks were a lot more individual. Um, but just pick out, and I'll just pick out, you know, Dalek Khan and Dalek Sek in particular. Khan, um, he was the Dalek who sort of had the prophecy of of um, the Doctor Donna and whatnot at the end of Series 4. Um he gets to draw two cards. So he gets that sort of advanced knowledge, as you said earlier on, Ben, about drawing cards is equal to gaining knowledge. Um, Dalek Sec also creates a 3-3 Black Dalek artifact. Well, he was trying to create a new form of Dalek. Um, so that, that ties in very, very well, and I really like that. I love that we get all the different types of Master, like I love or the different the different versions of the Master. Um, I love the art. For the Roger Delgado Master, it's really trippy. Um, he looks very, very sinister. He, it just looks great. Um, I think my favourite of all of them, though, is the Mast, is the uh, Harold Saxon version of the Master, the John Sim version. Really strong card, and this was the one card out of the whole set that came out, and I said I would love to build a deck around him specifically. Um, so he has this Myriad uh, mechanic, which I'd mentioned earlier. Ben, you'd maybe give us a wee rundown of Myriad. Yes. Myriad is a multiplayer mechanic. So if a creature has Myriad and say you have three other opponents, so there's four people playing and you attack the opponent right in front of you uh, with a Myriad creature for each opponent you're not attacking. So the two players to your right and left, you create a copy of the creature with Myriad that is uh, enters the battlefield attacking those two opponents. And at the end of combat, those creatures um, are removed from the game. The token creatures are gone and you can't get them back. So how the Master Multiplied works is, he's a creature with Myriad, um, but triggered abilities you control, i.e. the ability in Myriad that triggers at the end of combat for you to sacrifice your creatures, can't cause your Myriad tokens to be removed. So each copy of the Master you create um, can't disappear at the end of combat so it gets out of hand very quickly he also says the legend rule doesn't apply to creature tokens you control it was something I didn't mention earlier um, 
legendary creatures have a caveat that you can only have one of that card under your control at any given point. So if the master was to create copies of himself with Myriad, usually those creatures would be instantly uh, destroyed because um, they would also be legendary. Um, but this card gets around that by altering the rules here. It says the legend rule doesn't apply. So you can have as many masters as you want and they don't disappear to the Myriad trigger. This puts a two or three turn clock of the game. If the master multiplied is not dealt with, he will win. It is extremely strong because suddenly you'll have, you start with one and then you'll have four and then each one of those will make copies. And then uh, I haven't done the miles in my head, but you can see how this will get out of hand. Very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he seems to be very, very strong. And that's, you know, that's based around the end of time where the master sort of copied and turned every every person in the world into a version of himself. So that's, that's you know, what that sort of represents there. Yeah, he certainly seems very powerful because um, the one penalty with him I found is, um, of course, with the whole commander format, I'm, I'm of course not used to that because they didn't, well, apparently they did have it back when I used to play, but I hadn't heard of it at the time. But um, since your commander, you can only have cards of their colour, he's not going to work as the commander of this deck because he doesn't have blues. So you'd have to construct your own deck, which of course, that's part of the game. That's fun, but... It does mean you can't use him for this specific deck, which does give him a tiny disadvantage at least. Yes, but if, if you do go down the route of building your own deck, you will be able to include other cards, you know, from other magic sets that will play into that ability. And, you know, you, yeah. I, I imagine those cards would, you know, even, you know, could multiply the number of tokens he creates at any given time. It's just going to, it's, it's going to be really, really insane to run that card, I think. Not necessarily in black or red, you mm -hmm. would have cards like that, but you'd have cards in black and red that say whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses a life. And if he makes 20 creatures in a turn, that's each opponent losing 20 life. Like that'll yes. get it. There, there are lots of um, cards that will synergize with a master multiplied deck if you deconstruct the Masters of Evil deck and, and go down that route. Yes, another card that leaped out to me as, as, as particularly strong is the Cyber Controller. Um, and he's actually one I think, I, 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 my, my take on Commander is you want to get your Commander out as soon as possible in the game and um, that you can make use of their effect. I think with the Cyber Controller, you keep him back for as long as you can and then you play him out. So the way he works is whenever he enters the battlefield, um, you can pay an additional amount of mana beyond his ordinary cost. Um, and whenever you do that, each opponent mills that number of cards. So say, so he requires two blue mana and one black mana to play. You can pay an additional number of, of any colors then. So say you play an extra six mana to play him, each opponent has to mill six cards. And what that means is they just take six cards off the top of their library, off their deck, and put it straight into the graveyard. Um, and that can eat up your deck very quickly. Um, what the cyber controller does is any creature cards milled in this way um come onto your battlefield face down as two sort of power two toughness two cyberman artifact creatures and other artifact creatures you control get plus one plus one as long as you have the cyber controller right so what that basically means is you get to take if, if you wait until a fairly late stage in the game where you have a lot of mana built up you can tap all of that and cast the cyber controller out with a lot of extra mana on them um, and you can have opponents mill I have done this in a game actually how many I think I got something like 14 cybermen out onto my board Good. Uh, at one stage through simply through playing this one card it's really strong it's really powerful and it's a lot of fun to play um other one I wanted to single out was the Vashta Narada. Um, so he is, uh, or this card is indestructible, which means it can't be destroyed. Um, and it also has shadow. And what shadow does is uh, it can only block or be blocked by creatures that also have shadow. So that ties in. That's that's an existing magic, the gathering mechanic. Um, From back when I was playing Tempest, it was brand new then. <laughs> And it, again, it ties really well into the Doctor Who flavouring of the whole thing. Um, so that's great. He's a really strong card. He basically can't be killed, um, which sort of works well because the Vashta Narada 
you know, are a swarm, it's impossible to wipe them all out. Um, it also has, at the beginning of each end step, so at the end of each turn, if a creature died this turn, it gets a 1-1 one, one counter. That builds up very quickly because that works on other people's turns as well. So at the, and whenever anyone ends their turn, if something, if a creature died, if a creature was destroyed, the Vashta Narada gets a 1-1 one, one counter, um, which builds up the strength. And of course, because it can't be blocked, that's only a good thing because it's going to build up over the course of a game and it's going to hit your opponent's for extra damage each time so that's great um you've also got yes you had mentioned turlo and that's great he's sort of he he whenever you play him um he doesn't necessarily go to your battlefield you can send him to, for another player to take control of which sort of represents the black guardian putting the turlo into the doctor's tardis crew as as a sort of um uh, a sp not a spy, Turlo gets sent to kill the Doctor. Um, what Turlo does is, at the beginning of each end step, he lets you draw a card, but you lose life equal to the number of cards in your hand. So whoever controls him loses life each turn for as long as they control Turlo, um, as long as they have cards in their hand. Um, so I like that, that he gets sent across to sort of act as a, you throw a spanner in someone else's works by giving them this card. That's that's great. Um, You've also got the laser screwdriver, which I like because it does the exact opposite at each stage to everything the sonic screwdriver does. Whereas the sonic screwdriver lets you untap something, the laser screwdriver taps it. So that means you can, if someone else wants to use an artifact, they have to tap it. You can use the laser screwdriver to make that, that they can't use it effectively. Um, so that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, and then we'll have some of the sagas for this as well. Uh, the ones I've picked out from the deck are Death in Heaven, which um, starts the first two turns of that site. Um, you choose a player to mill two of their cards, take them off their library and put them into the graveyard. They then exile their graveyard, which means those cards can't be played normally. So there's some cards, some decks revolve quite heavily around using, you know, putting a card into your graveyard and then playing it back out. Um, Paradox Power would be one of those. Um, Death in Heaven stops that from happening. It puts those cards beyond use for anything that's not Death in Heaven because the third card says that any creature cards that have been exiled with Death in Heaven come back onto your battlefield face down under your control and they're 2-2 two -two Cybermen. So that's effectively Missy turning the graveyards of the world into Cybermen conversion factories. Um, so that's very, very strong. Um then you've got Genesis of the Daleks. The first three turns it's out, it just creates uh, Daleks. Um, so for each lower counter, so the first round, it'll create one Dalek. The second, it'll create two Daleks. So that's a total of three so far. The third, it creates another three. Builds up a total of six Daleks off uh, Genesis. And then the fourth step, it sort of recreates that, do I have the right moment, um, which is probably one of the most famous moments in classic Doctor Who. Um where a target opponent faces a villainous choice, they can either destroy all Dalek creatures and each opponent loses life equal to the total power of Daleks that died on this turn, or they can destroy all non-Dalek creatures. And that's a choice between destroying the Daleks or destroying everything else. That's the choice the Doctor faces effectively at the end of that story. And this recreates that the player has to make that same choice. That's really, really fun. Um, is there anything we'd like to add about Masters of Evil? Uh, I think that's covered everything pretty well. There's not much else I can think to say. It's um, Yeah, I love those cards. I think the Death in Heaven one sounds like it would be pretty powerful in a Cyberman-focused deck. And, of course, Genesis of the Daleks in a Dalek one. So you've got either end of the main villains. And, um, yeah, either one you could make a whole deck of just them without the other in. So, yeah, that seems like a great set of cards there. Yes, and like, you know, Ben and I, we have a friend who would play a lot of um, black decks, which involves using, you know, cards going into the graveyard and then playing out of them. That's going to really throw a spanner in that sort of deck, as I say. Yeah, there's a good amount of a good amount of those decks sort of in our pod. I have a couple. Um, another one of my friends has a couple, and then um, there are a few more slant about. So it's always good to see a bit of graveyard hate in your decks because you never know who's going to whip out the graveyard deck um, and they can kind of go unanswered without it. So it was good to highlight that card. 
I feel like just going back to what Connor said about the, the choices of commander in this deck, unlike the uh, Blast from the Past, Timey Wimey, and Paradox Power, this deck doesn't really have a game plan. Each one of those commanders does something unique, and they're all equally viable with what's in the rest of the commander deck. Um, there isn't a huge amount of villainous choice um, cards that synergize with Davros, so you're not obligated to play him. Uh, Missy would work just as well, and honestly, I think any of those other commander choices that work with this deck are totally fine to play. I don't think the contents of the commander deck force you into any particular commander, unlike maybe some of the other decks. I feel like you kind of want to be playing the 13th Doctor and Yaz in comparison to, say, the 12th Doctor and Clara. Even though they're totally viable, I feel like the cards in the 99 of the Paradox Power deck favour favor those two. And I feel like the 10th Doctor and Rose are, are every day the, the best commander choice for Timey Wimey. But I don't necessarily think Davros has to be for this one, which is interesting. Because just like how you can choose your favourite Doctor, you can choose whichever villain faction you like to look off most. And the deck will not be hampered by that. That's great. There's there's a lot of these cards where you can really praise the versatility of them um, because you can use them in so many different ways and you can run the decks in so many different ways. Um, was it something, I think, um, the professor, the professor is a, a YouTuber who has, uh, again, a big Doctor Who fan, uh, a big fan of magic. Um, did he say so there was something like 70 different choices you can make for running these decks as a commander or, or which, which commander these decks run? I think it's more than that. I think there were 70 in Blast from the Past alone that you could do and close to... Wait, I'm not sure, actually, off the top of my head what that figure was. Maybe we don't. Maybe we shouldn't mention that. Well, because in, a, in, have the... in any case, it's a lot. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to run these decks without any upgrades, without any changes, without taking any of the Doctor Who cards out and putting another one you know, from a different magic set in. Um. The last component of the set to talk about then is the plane chase cards. And I would mention plane chase earlier on, and Ben, maybe you would give us a little rundown uh, again just uh, for those. Yes, can do. Plane chase is a add-on to the commander format. So each person playing the game brings with them 10 plane chase cards, and everybody shuffles their plane chase cards into what's called the plane chase deck, which sort of sits in the middle. Um, and um, feel free to look up pictures of these. Um, I have a couple in my hand here, and they are chunky cards. Mm. They're, they're, they're quite big because they concern everybody. Um, they affect the whole battlefield. And at the start of the game, you have shuffled your plane chase deck, and you flip the top card. Uh, and... There are two components to a plane chase card. There is a passive effect that affects everybody. Um, this could be an effect that triggers at the start of your turn, at the end of your turn, or if something happens. Uh, and then there is a chaos effect, uh, which I will explain in a second. Um, plane chase involves using a planar die. This is just a regular six-sided die with two symbols on it. Um, and on your turn, you are free to roll the plane chase die once for free. If you want to roll it again, you have to pay one mana to do so by tapping the land. Um, if you want to roll it again after that, you pay two mana and then three mana, four mana, and so on. Uh, the plane chase die has a planeswalk symbol on it. That means if that's rolled, you flip over the next card of the plane chase deck onto the battlefield. Uh, and then there is a new passive effect. The other symbol is the chaos symbol. So on each plane chase card, there is an effect that happens if someone rolls the chaos symbol, and this tends to cause a bit of anarchy in the game uh, and spice things up. Uh, like all of the other cards in the set, uh, all the plane chase cards are extremely flavorful, and they do um, things associated with that location. For example, the TARDIS Bay, 
whenever you flip onto the TARDIS Bay, the passive effect says the first spell you cast during each of your turns with mana value two or greater has Cascade. And we talked a little earlier about the flavor with Cascade and the TARDIS. Uh, and whenever chaos ensues, so whenever a player rolls chaos on the dice while this plane is in effect, you gain control of tar target artifact and then planeswalk to a new plane. And what that is, I presume, is the Doctor stealing the TARDIS and Absol leaving Gallifrey Absolutely, whenever yes. chaos ensues. So that's just an example of, of what a typical uh, plane chase card will look like. So it adds another dimension to the game. And uh, it's it's nice that they included plane chase cards. And I will say they included 10 brand new plane chase cards with each deck. And it's nice that they do that because they don't do it very often. And it suits Doctor Who very well when you have all of those locations across the 60-year history of the show, uh, different planets, different uh, different uh, time zones and, and periods of time to explore. Um, so it does suit the, the sort of the playability of the decks together um, very well. And that's just a, a little overview of playing chase. It's funny you should mention the TARDIS Bay, actually, because I think there's an additional bit of flavoring on here, which I don't even think is entirely intentional. Um, but it's the passive effect, as you say, is the first spell you cast during each of your turns with mana value two or greater has cascade. Um, and there's been a couple of Doctor Who stories, and this it's some of them are from Big Finish, um, which we talk a lot about on this podcast, um, which have made something of this particular moment. The one that comes to mind is called The Light at the End. It was released for Doctor Who's 50th anniversary in 2013. And it basically, you know, spoilers for anyone who hasn't heard it, there'll be a lot of regular Big Finish listeners, you know, listening to our podcast. Um, but, you know, spoilers for anyone who hasn't heard it, that story sort of revolves around the Master destroying the TARDIS. Um, all through, you know, wiping the TARDIS out of history and the Doctor's life changing entirely because of that. So I like that this TARDIS Bay moment, which is um, this card sort of based around Name of the Doctor, which shows the first Doctor stealing the TARDIS, that every moment in Doctor Who's history has cascaded from this one moment. Um, so I think that card type, you know, using Cascade does tie in very well with that as well. Um, as I said, I don't think that was entirely... Um, intentional flavoring but it is there nonetheless and i think it works really well jimmy what do you think of the plain chase cards yeah obviously this is a type of card that wasn't around back when i used to play and so it's interesting to see these new mechanics and new ideas and i think it works well for doctor who to represent all the different times and places across all the years that have been in all these different stories the other thing I like is, of course, since it's such a bigger card, is you can see the art much better. And some of the art they've got on these is really brilliant. I think uh, two in particular, they did a lovely shot of Pompeii for the Fires of um, Fires of Pompeii episode and um, excellent shot of Bowie Base 1 from uh, Waters of Mars. But, of course, huge partner fan that I am. Uh, the uh, two that I particularly like is um, Coal Hill School and the Cave of Skulls from the first story. Um, Cave of Skulls, it's mainly for the art. I think the way they've realised, it's like, oh, we're not just going to have it be looking like it was on TV. We're going to give a full mammoth skeleton in the background and it just looks really cool. It would have been amazing to see something like that in the show. Um, and Coal Hill School, I think, yeah, the art's good. The Ian and Barbara meeting Susan and everything that that set him off. But um, I think the uh, actual mechanics there work pretty well like it's got the thing about historic cards again and that letting you draw a card, which works perfect with Barbara being a history teacher and probably ties into her ability about history cards um, that was on her own card. And again, the chaos ensues thing about returning history cards from your graveyard. That's, I mean, they go back into history. That's what it is. It's time travel show and it's that's where the journey started. And so I think they did really well to get a good little mechanic that's perfectly fitting and tie it to that first story and brilliant art of just them in the school, in the history teaching, the history room, and, you know, they're actually going to real history from there. I think it's, yeah, such a great card. Just as, as you mentioned, the ones that have great art, um, I'm looking at one at the moment. It's called Caught in a Parallel Universe. And it it's it's a, the, a full art spread of Inferno. 
um, which I know uh, is, has been very popular. I remember listening to your guys doing the you, know, you guys doing the season by season episode uh, on season seven and really praising Inferno. I think the art for that's great. It has the Brigadier and Liz Shaw on the right and it has their Inferno universe versions on the other side. So it's the two versions, the two universes side by side. It's really great art. Um, I've picked out a couple of my favorite ones and um, the TARDIS Bay was one of them. Um, but you've also got stuff like the Spectrox Mines from Caves of Androzani and the Aplan Mortarium from uh, Flesh and Stone. It was the Weekly Angel two-parter in series five. What those do, they both do something that's fairly similar. So just take the Spectrox Mines for an example. When you planeswalk to them, so whenever you arrive and at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose three life and you create a treasure token. That's effectively you being poisoned by the Spectrox poison in, in those mines. Um, the Aplon Mortarium does the same sort of thing. It has, uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, put an exposure counter on Aplon Mortarium. You then lose life equal to the number of exposure counters. And so that's the radiation from the crashed, uh, the crashed starship building up and harming you. So you, you want to try and get away from that location as quickly as you can. Pompeii is great as well, because there's a wee bit of... Uh, a wee bit of chance involved in it. So uh, whenever you planeswalk to it in the beginning of each turn, you put an eruption counter on it. Whenever you roll a blank on the planar die, uh, you scry to and then put another uh, eruption counter on it. So that you're more likely to roll a blank on the die than not. So that again builds up like Pompeii, you know, the volcano's building up and getting ready to blow. When you roll and chaos ensues, um, Pompeii erupts and deals damage to each creature and each player equal to the number of eruption counters on it. So that's, you know, the volcano builds up and builds up for as long as you're there. And then if you happen to roll for chaos, the volcano erupts and destroys everything around it pretty much. Um, I think the moon base is also quite funny because all creatures have, if you pay two, it gains flying until the end of turn. And that's just very simply, they're on the moon, there's lower gravity and they can jump over the opposition. So I think that's there's there's a lot of really fun cards in there. Is there anything we'd like to add about Plane Chase, or shall we move on? I will say that I think if you buy the four decks and you're playing with them, that Plane Chase serves them. I think you want to be playing these with Plane Chase. It just adds that extra dimension, makes it feel a little bit more Doctor Who, and a lot of the decks have cards in them that care about Plane Chase, so that's how they've been designed as well. Um I like to think of these decks as their own separate board game in that I'm not sure I would say, I don't necessarily think they'd hold up well against someone's tailored commander deck that they've uh, hyper-optimized and um, constructed to be as strong as possible and to win. I think they're going to lack behind a little bit on that regard. But if you've got four people and you want to have you know a bit of crack, playing a game that you can break out these four decks, play plain chase and in a pod just use them in that way and, and I think that's where they really shine. I, I, I would agree with that. I think I think you're spot on there. They do work very well against each other. Um but but there's stuff in there like the TARDIS, like Susan Foreman as you say, that are specifically designed and it says in the text that they are there to interact with the plain chase cards. Yeah. I do think they're best played with those cards um going on um so the last component of the whole doctor who set that has come out then is they've done doctor who collector boosters so there's different types of magic boosters which ben would maybe give us a little bit of an overview on um but focusing mostly on the collector boosters yes although this is soon to be outdated from next year because wizards of the coast are once again changing the the uh the type of boosters they're going to be selling but currently um there are boosters for playing with which are called draft boosters um there are boosters for simply opening and taking the cards out of uh which are called set boosters and then you have premium boosters which have special alt art versions and foil versions um off off the cards um and the more expensive collector boosters and the idea with the Doctor Who decks was and the Doctor Who release was that they didn't want to put any mechanically unique cards into booster packs. They wanted, if you buy all four decks, you have the whole set, which I really like. But if you want alt art versions or foil versions or borderless versions of the cards, they're only inside the collector boosters. 
So I, I did buy one of these just purely for the novelty of, 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 of having one. Um, because I got, I got into magic roughly about a year ago. I got into it specifically to play these decks. Um, that was, that was these decks existing was the reason I started playing Magic the Gathering. Um, so I got one of the collector boosters just to see what it got. And I think it did quite well out of it. There was a couple of nice cards in there. Um, just off the top of my head, I, took, I got a foil borderless version of Heroes Podium, which is the, uh, it's from the five doctors. It's the little podium and the little statues that the different versions of the doctor and their companions get set on to bring them into the death zone. Um, so that was quite nice. Um, I got a couple of the alt art ones. I'm actually not too keen on the alt art versions of these cards generally. Um, they've been sort of done in a cartoonish style. Um, and I think I prefer the more realistic version that comes, you know, as the standard art. Um, but uh, I got, I got, I did quite well. I got a nice borderless version of the Ninth Doctor. I think I got the alt art version of the Fugitive Doctor, which was pretty decent. Um, I got some of the Surge foil cards as well, which are slightly different. I think they have more foiling, and there's a, a special sort of pattern on the Surge foil cards. They're a little bit distracting because I think it slightly obscures the um, art. Um, certainly if you're under heavy lighting, um, but they are very, very nice to look oh, at. They are beautiful, yeah. But that's I think that's basically what the collector boosters amount to is. These cards are great. They're pretty to look at. You don't need them to play the game because, as we say, all the mechanically unique cards are in the main decks. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's, 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 it's just slightly nicer treatments of the same cards, really. I even think, and this is the this is the same thing about any booster pack. Now these um these decks or this set only comes with the collector boosters. It, it is purely just for people who want to get those alt art versions or to or to spice up and foil and bling out their commander decks. Um, I would say that if there is a particular card you wanted an alternate version of, to just buy that card as a single. And there are, are, are plenty of online retail places where you can buy single copies of cards. Because if you buy a collector booster, there's only 15 cards in it. You're not likely to get one of the cards that you really want. Um, they are quite expensive. Um, so it's always better to, to, if there's a card you really want, is to just buy the single off it from a secondhand retail place. That is extremely fair. The last thing we'll talk about then, and it's just to end on, is um, some of our favorite art, some of our favorite art pieces from the sets and some of our favorite cards. Um, so, Jimmy, maybe you would tell us about some of your favorite cards or some of your favorite uh, art showings from these from these uh, Doctor Who cards. Uh, well, first and foremost, it's got to be that Vincent van Gogh card I mentioned earlier from the final scene of Vincent and the Doctor. That's just easily the best art wise seeing Vincent van Gogh in Vincent van Gogh's art style from that moment. Wonderful. And the other ones that I particularly love are the ones that like you were saying about um, how they've sort of done what classic who would have been like if it had infinite budget and they could realize everything exactly as they wanted to. And seeing stuff like the monoptera of both rest and the card and the generic monoptera in the tokens just realised looking like actual alien monsters and looking realistic, but taking the web planet to a new level, that that's brilliant. And I love the um, the cave of skulls, like I said, the giant mammoth skeleton in it as well, and stuff like that is the stuff that particularly appeals to me. And um, I think most of the art's good. I mean, there's very little art in the sets that I didn't like. I think Ace's face and also Rassilon's were a bit off and didn't really look like the acts in question. But other than little niggles like that and other such quibbles, I think mostly the art in this set is brilliant. Another one I'd have to say would be the plane chase card for the free doctors, seeing, you know, gel guards surrounding the house and, you know, they've actually got this whole vortex effect in the sky and like, if three doctors had had a big budget that it could have used, that's what it would have looked like. And yeah, cards like that are the ones that are particularly appealing to me. And that's why I wish the, um, like you were saying about different types of boosters, um, since each deck did come with those sort of mini boosters with just a couple of cards, um, it was nice to see on some of them, the, um, the foil thing doesn't really appeal to me. Like I don't see the point of them. Like, I mean, 
it, I'd rather just have a normal looking card. Like it's the alternate art or the widescreen art with no frame that looks really good to me and seeing more of that art because yeah, the art in this set is amazing. Like practically every card looks brilliant. I mean, some more than others, but um, there's very few duds. It's an amazing set. I hope that, I think one of you was saying earlier before we started recording about how the um, the artists of other magic sets have sometimes sold prints of their art. And um, I think there's quite a few cards here that I would like to get if they did that this time around. I mean, it'd be hard to decide because there's so many good ones, really. Very much so. I, I don't think there's very many cards where I, I can criticise the art at all. Um, broadly speaking, it's all been very, very beautiful. Have you had any favourite cards, either mechanically or, or visually, Ben? Um, yes. Uh, the the extra, turn, the extra turn card is a bit of a pet card, just because of that explosive game we had with it. Mm-hmm. And we didn't realise that that deck was capable of... of of taking three or four turns in a row. Like it kind of just came out of nowhere, but no, it wouldn't be my favorite card in terms of art. There's one card, which I saw uh, in the build up to these decks coming out, which is, I would say is the card that, that put me on board with the set. And it would be four knocks, um, which is of course the heartbreaking moment in the end of time part two, where, Wealth gets locked inside the, the the chamber, and um, they do the wee the wee switcheroo where they tease the four knocks all season, and you think it's going to be the master, and then it's not. It's wealth, and that seems great. Uh, it's the combination of tenants era, and the art on that card resembles. I'm looking at it right now, and I was speechless when I saw it, and I'm struggling to to, to formulate words on it now because. It just captures that moment brilliantly. It captures the pain on David Tennant's face. It captures the the grief and concern on Will's face. Um, and it is just, I think it's just the perfect, the perfect card, to be honest, in my opinion. And the flavor text is great too. Um, so I'd say that's the card that that I really like. Um, it's the card that made me made me it made me super excited for these decks coming out. When I saw that card, I said, "Yeah, they're not gonna, they're not gonna screw this up. They're gonna, they're really gonna hit the flavor on the on the on the head here." And they did. I really think they did. I think the flavor in this this set is 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 spectacular, and the cards have been designed primarily to achieve that flavor. And I think that's why maybe the decks are are a little bit underpowered because they weren't designed. To be powerful, they were designed to capture the magic of Doctor Who, and um, some of those moments are a little bit more heartbreaking than others, like this card. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think that's probably my favorite card. It's it's a great. I remember us flicking through the art when that came out, um, and I, it wasn't the card at that stage. I think it was just the art. It and was. I, you're right. I remember. I remember you gasped as soon as that came up. I, I do remember that moment. So there's a couple I would single out as as being among my favourites. Um, there's a, a pre-existing card called Command Tower, which um, it's a land that plays in. It can tap for any mana in your commander's colour identity. So any mana that you need, this can tap for. Um, and that the art for this is the different some of the different TARDIS control rooms. I think my favourite of them is the tenth, the ninth and tenth Doctor's control room. I think it's very striking. It's a great representation of that room and the lighting and the different ways it was lit in the show. Did they do a different one for each of the decks? They did. They did the first Doctor's control room for the Blast from the Past uh, deck. They did the twelfth Doctor's, uh, which looks great for Paradox Power, and they actually did the Master's TARDIS for... Um, uh, Masters of Evil, um, which looks amazing. And I don't think it's a version of the control room that was ever shown on screen. It's a sort of mashup of the Masters' different ones. Um, the, the Master never really had a particular one. Um, I think there's even, I think there's even the little, um, dinosaur embryo from the Rani's TARDIS, uh, in there as well. So it's, it's a nice villainous version of the TARDIS. 
Um, you've also got the Time Lord regeneration, which sort of represents the Fifth Doctor's regeneration. This is another example of them doing art that l sort of expands on the imagery from the TV series. Um, and it just looks amazing um, and sort of realizes it better than the BBC had the budget to at the time. It's the Fifth Doctor, um, unconscious. Um, you can see he's a bit battered. He has the mud from Androzani down his coat lapels. But he has the different faces of his commanders behind him. Or the different faces of his, of his companions behind him, rather. Um, and it's just, it's shown a little bit more than the TV series had the, the ability to. It looks fantastic. Um, you've also got stuff like Three Visits, which is the three doctors, uh, from the three doctors, sort of communicating and uh, sort of in conference with each other. Um, heroic Intervention is stunning. It's based on the two doctors. It's like the sixth doctor rushing to save the second. It looks great. Some of the lands uh, as well, the TARDIS in different locations. Um, there's Sky Cloud Expanse, which is the TARDIS sitting in the clouds from the snowmen. Uh, the planes card is the TARDIS on a really, really well-realized version of Androzani. Um, there's Ecstatic Beauty, as was mentioned earlier. And this was one I didn't see, so I, I looked up. I thought I'd seen all the cards before they arrived, but this is one that I pulled out of the decks and saw for the first time as I was opening them. The card's called Explore. It's Again, it's a pre-existing magic card that's been redone with Doctor Who art. But the art on it is the seventh Doctor and Ace walking away into the sunset. from the. It's the very last shot of the classic series. Um, and it has that Seventh Doctor's little monologue from the end that somewhere there's danger, somewhere there's injustice line. Um, that's the flavor text at the bottom of it. I just love that that very last moment of classic Doctor Who got represented in these cards. It's on a card called Explore, which is what the Seventh Doctor and Ace are going off to do in that scene. It just looks fantastic, and I love it so much. Um, but I think that's 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 possibly all we have time for unless there's would, would you like to give us a we just what do you think generally of the doctor who sets then just to wrap us up um jimmy tell us what you think of the doctor who set as a whole overall i think it's brilliant i think um i'd love to see it continue if they decided to do some more and just fill those gaps the companions that got missed or stories that um weren't represented as much and maybe different color versions of the existing characters where they've sort of might have fit better in other colors that could be something for the future or even going to spin-off territory and give us a sarah jane adventures and torchwood cards um there's all sorts of opportunities there or even tying into big finish like um you, I, I expect they wouldn't be able to do much but i mean the Eighth Doctor did name check his audio companions in his one TV appearance. Maybe we could get him an actual companion card of Charlie or Lucy. Um, yeah, I'd just love to see it continue. I think they did really well, and um, the few faults and problems I have with it could be fixed by expanding it and giving different colour identities to the existing characters and adding the characters who haven't been represented yet. And Ben, your general overview of the Doctor Who set. Well, before I give that, I, I definitely like the sound of, of Jimmy's idea about revisiting the Doctors again and perhaps with new colour identities. Um, none of the Doctors have black in their colour identities, which it works for most of them. But a lot of the Doctors definitely have darker moments. And I feel like there's maybe, you, you would know more about it than I would, but there's maybe some points in the show's history where you could get a Doctor card represented with a bit of black in it. I actually thought, before they announced the colours, I thought, oh, come on, they're going to make the first Doctor black and white. It would actually fit. I mean, he <laughs> was very dark in his early days, and he eventually became more about order and about not changing history. He would have been perfect as a black and white card, and it would have been such a good pun too. It, it surprised me that the War Doctor, for example, didn't have any black um, in him. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting him to have have the the colours of white and red, or, or at least um, he could have white, red, and maybe a little bit of black as well, um, for being sort of that that darker doctor. But at least Clara is there. That if any player wants to put black in the deck, they can run Clara as the companion and then choose black as her colour. So I, I appreciate that that they did that. In terms of what I thought of the decks overall, I, I really, really liked them. I was somewhat apprehensive whenever um, they were announced because 
magic has a rich 30 year history it has its own lore it has its own um, stories and characters and that's strong enough to stand on its own um it's a complaint that a lot of people have with universes beyond and while i don't share all of those views i understand that it it would it has to be done really well um if it's not done well at all or, or if it's done, if it's done to, to sort of to sort of a poor quality, uh, it might come across as um, somewhat of a, of a cash grab or, or capitalizing on on another IP to, to sell product. And I definitely don't think that that's what's happened here. I think these decks have been made with love and care by people that love both Magic and Doctor Who, and that really shows with how the decks are built and the card designs. I think the decks are somewhat underpowered, even compared to some existing pre-constructed decks that you can buy off the shelf. Um, some of the decks, like Masters of Evil, kind of lack a coherent game plan, where you're kind of just playing cards and doing what they do and not really sure and sure what you're going to do next. You don't know what you're looking for necessarily. Um, the deck gameplay kind of just assembles itself as you go along. Um, the most fun I had with these decks was playing one game with the face commanders and then saying, right, who can I put as my commander next? And running through all the possible doctor and companion combinations and find which ones work really well with um, the next one. Um, I didn't really enjoy how the fourth doctor and Sarah Jane played. So whenever I played the Blast from the Past deck, I put in the first doctor and Susan Foreman because I just wanted that classic fly the TARDIS and go somewhere new and um, no strings attached kind of feel. And I, and I really loved exploring that myself. Uh, the decks work extremely well as a deck building tool, toolkit. Um, I've taken, taken that opinion again from, from this guy, the professor on Tolarian Community College's YouTube channel. Um, in his review of the set, he said um, that the decks work really well as a set that you can dip into and build whatever you want out of. And I would definitely share that opinion. If you've spent money and got all four of these decks, you've got hundreds of hours of experimenting and building different combinations of all the cards in the set. Um, it's an amazing product for that. And if you're a Doctor Who fan, it is a good way to get introduced into magic, um, even if some of the decks are are maybe a bit complicated. You'll certainly learn the rules quick enough if you want to pilot them. <laughs> Crash course through the rules of the finer interactions of magic, stacks and layers and, and all that lovely stuff. So I think it's a great product. Um, I, I'm a Doctor Who fan. I'm not the biggest Doctor Who fan, not compared to, to my brother here. Um, but I am a big magic fan and they brought the two of them together really well. I, I think from my point of view, like you, you had played Magic for a couple of years before this was even announced. And I, I had always sort of, I, I, I had always said it wasn't for me. But then this came out and I was just like, well, now I have to get involved. Like I have no choice now. Um, but I, as soon as they came out, and I, I, I remember saying this at the time, I was delighted that our two favorite things had suddenly come together. And, you know, we were going to be able to, you know, you know, have a Doctor Who magic, you know, you know, play Doctor Who in magic, that sort of thing. Um, I can't describe just the, the joy, you know, that I feel whenever I'm playing these decks and I'm flipping out a card and suddenly there's a character I know and love in my hand and I can play it in a game. Um, I love, you know, the art is just so evocative of the show. It's... It's, it's almost how we think of the show in our heads rather than the, you know, shoestring BBC budget it was made on. Um, that's the sort of approach they've taken um, with how they look. Um, I just love being able to play, you know, like I say, I can't describe the joy I feel when I'm playing the 10th Doctor on Dead Battlefield or I'm seeing him out on, you know, on the mat in front of me. It, it's, it's, it's just so much fun. It's been realised really well. You know, when we when we set up, we got the decks in and had a couple of people over and we when we played all of the decks um while we were playing them we had the four R Doctor Who soundtrack, you know, yeah, playlist yeah. going on in the background. And, you know, I, I reach in and 
to my library and draw the farewell card, which is obviously the Tenth Doctor's um, regeneration on the art of it. And as I draw that, uh, his regeneration theme is playing in the background. And it was just a really special night getting to to uh, explore those cards and and um, experience them like that. After a long wait, they were announced a year before they came out, so there had been a lot of build up towards it. I was getting very frantic by the end. You were. <laughs> Where's the postman? <laughs> Uh, but I think that's. I think we'll have to leave it there. We've 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 got a lot of talking out of these decks, um, and I think that's just about all we'll have time for. So I'll say thank you very much to Jimmy. Thanks. It's been great to chat about. And I'll say thank you very much uh, to Ben for coming on and sharing your magic knowledge with us. Oh, you're very welcome. It was it was it was fun to be on, and thanks for having me. And thank you all very much for listening. We'll be back next week for more podcasting, and we'll see you all then. Goodbye now. There we are. I want to play them now. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs>